This is the Convict Australia podcast. Thank you for tuning in. Hi everyone, I would just like to start by acknowledging the Darawal speaking people who are the traditional custodians of this land and I pay my respects to Elders both past, present and future. Today I'll be talking about James Roos with one of his descendants, Janice Roos Huntington. Welcome Janice. Thank you. So you've done... So you've done extensive research over the years on James Roos and have even written a book. And um, can you tell us a bit about James? He's one of the, well, better known convicts in Australia. Yes, he's, um, he was termed the humble adventurer by Captain Watkintensh, who interviewed him, took quite interesting convicts. And he's sort of a quiet achiever. He, um, when they sent the first fleet out, they didn't much account for what type of people they'd need and they weren't very prepared to set up a colony. But James Roos had been uh, a husbandman, as he referred to himself, which is a, a land landowner of a lower degree, not a squire, and um, in Cornwall. So that's how he probably attracted attention to his skills. And he may have, he probably did work on the government farm at the first. And he claims on his own headstone that he sowed the forest, forest grain in a, in a Cornish um, phonetic way. His, so his could, yeah. Sorry, so could you tell us a bit about his early life, like before he was convicted? Where was he living? Yes, he was, he was uh, born in a little village called Lewiton which is just outside Launceston or Launceston. And he was um, a, one of four children and he was a farmer. He grew up a farmer or a husbandman. Um, he m- married at the age of 19. He married a 33-year-old woman. Really? <laughs> really, yes. <laughs> which is interesting because uh, his own mother had died when he was seven. Uh, whether he was looking for a mother figure mm. or what. <laughs> and they had, uh, his wife Susanna had two children, little girl died in infancy, and then a son. Now the son lived and had his own line in Cornwall, his own line of roosters. So there are the roosters over there and with the name and roosters over here without the name. Um, he, for some reason, he turned to burglary Maybe she was an expensive woman to keep. <laughs> but he broke into a house and uh, stole a watch and uh, goods to the value of 10 shillings. A watch worth five pounds and got caught. Did he do it with anybody else? I don't, we don't know. There's no mention of it. There's no mention of it anywhere. But he was convicted alone and he was sentenced. In those days, um, he was sentenced to death. There were crimes called with, with the benefit of clergy and those certain crimes, death was the automatic sentence. But yeah. he was, the, the judges did have the authority to commute it to seven or 14 years and his was commuted to seven years. First at Africa when they thought, then they thought it was a bit inhospitable for the fair English folk and then, then sentenced to Australia. Yeah, it's funny that they commuted a death sentence to seven years. You'd think they'd commute it to life. Yeah. But he's well, one really of the shortest them. sentences. Yeah. Well, I didn't really want them, the convicts anymore, that the prisons were getting full and they were trying to get rid of them so, out of the country. So where did he go as soon as, he's, as soon as he was sentenced? Where did they take him? Well, he ended up on the Hulk Dunkirk, which he told what contents. But the Dunkirk wasn't commissioned till I think, 18, 1786. And James Drew's sentence was, um, was uh, 1790, uh, 1790. So but he was somewhere in, in that time. He could have been on another Hulk. He could have been in prison. 
but that's that's where he ended his time. And he was four and a half years on a hulk or in prison before he was sent to Australia. Wow. That must have been frustrating to think you're nearing the end of your sentence and then you're going to be sent to the other side of the world so far away from your family and children. Yeah. Yeah. So which ship was he on on the first fleet? The Scarborough. Right, okay. And what happened when he arrived? Do you know if he was assigned work straight away or...? But it's not, there's nothing much recorded about it. Assume, assume that he did go to the government farm to, to work with um, Philip's um, entourage. And uh, maybe he got the opportunity to apply for a, a grant for himself. But it said that he applied and was knocked back because the paperwork hadn't been received from England. And that was but, his uh, um, his sentence, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. And that was but, for everyone on the first fleet. None of their records yes, were sent right. out. So Governor Philip was in this really awkward position. All mm. these convicts were coming to him saying, my sentence has expired uh, and he had no proof no, and no, didn't know no what proof. to do. He was writing to England <laughs> saying, what do I do? Please send the paperwork. And I believe it was it took more than two years for that paperwork to come out? Well, um, there's a, well, of course the colony was starving. I think it was pretty desperate to get something happening. And so I don't know, we don't know whether um, James Roos approached him or I've got a, a theory, and this is only a theory because I, I don't believe in putting anything down that uh, might be taken as a truth. But it's interesting that James Roos was born in Lewitton, just outside Launceston, and Philip Gidley King, who also came on the Scarborough, was born in Launceston. Oh. Uh, three, uh, well, they were born about a couple of years apart, one or two years apart. They were virtually the same age, down the road, neighbours. And you can't tell me that on the, the Scarborough they both were. Two Cornish lads wouldn't have got together and had a bit of a chat. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he may have um, said to Philip, well, there's a bloke who, who is a farmer in Cornwall. He, it may be in that way. Maybe it wasn't that Bruce struck, jumped up and said, I want a land grant. And I believe, that, I believe that there were so few convicts or anyone that had any kind of farming experience. That's right, yes. So he would have... Well selected at all. Yeah. So... Um, Governor Philip granted him land. How much land did he get? Do you know? He, he gave him to work on um, one and a half acres and built him a hut, a brick hut, wow. and gave him some basic stock and a couple of convicts to help him with the land and said that he, he wanted him to prove in what time a person could become self-sufficient off the land. And if he did that, he would be granted the 30 acres, which and he did, did he yep. proved, and he did receive the 30 acres, which was experiment farm. But a testimony to his uh, stubbornness or his pride is that at one stage in the experiment, people thought he was starving and offered uh, extra stores, and he, he just refused to take them in, until his wife was pregnant, and then he took extra stores for her and, and the baby. So, so very, this is a new yeah. wife? A yeah, new wife, yes. He married Eliz Elizabeth Perry, who came out on the second fleet. So she was a convict also? Yes. And, uh, and yes, and they had a very, very long and interesting marriage. And she was very supportive, strong woman, um, country girl from, from England, and very competent. And when he was not able to be around after floods and things and had to go to sea to support the family, she ran the show. So she, like a, like Elizabeth and MacArthur, a couple of strong women there, and they end up neighbours. Yeah. Um, so when he said he was self-sufficient, did he include his family or was it just yes. him off the stores? No, him, the whole family off the stores. 
And did it get to the point where he was supplying the stores with food as well, or is it just just his family? No, he, they became to supply food stores. He, he, he succeeded very well. What we're doing, and part of the reason, and this is very interesting, it, what what contention again? He took interest in the convicts, visited him often, and, and interviewed him, and. James was described to what contention, how he prepared the land. Of course, he said that the government farm it was just turned over and you know, not very well prepared. But he burned ash and trees and he turned it back into the land and he planted turnips and then turned them into land. He was virtually making compost. All right. And do you know, you've, you've mentioned a few things, but you do know what he was growing primarily there? Uh, maize and wheat of uh, several things yeah i couldn't <laughs> exactly name them all at the moment but yeah the basic staples of of life and were there any um floods and you know oh there's the poor man not not so much not, yes in Parramatta, um not really floods in Parramatta, but when he sold his property to Surgeon John Harris, he moved in 1793, 1793, he moved to, um, up to, um, around the Windsor Way, the new settlement up there, and with a few other convicts, and the land was very fertile, but it was fertile because they got so much flooding, and the, um, apparently the Aboriginals warned them, because they, they'd been there historically long enough to know that there were regular floods. So these poor settlers, they've settled, oh, there's a nice, nice bit of water here, and <laughs> this will be lovely, and horrendous floods, houses destroyed, uh, devastating floods. So where was uh, his first property? Uh, Harris Park, which is right. now Paris, yeah. And then he decided to sell up. Do we know why he decided? Well, it's interesting. It, it's recorded that he wanted to go home. And it could be many reasons why he didn't go home. Maybe with he and Elizabeth, they'd both been convicts. How would they be treated back there? Did they have a better life here? Um, James Roos's wife had, she hadn't remarried, but she'd had another child while he was <laughs> on the ships or out here. So maybe, maybe he knew about that. I don't know how much communication there was between. Uh, decided not to. But the interesting thing is he sold his property to Surgeon John Harris at 40 pounds, while other properties around were selling for much more than that. And I don't know, I wonder why he sold it for so little. Was he under pressure to sell? Mm. Yeah, I guess we'll never know. Yeah, so many things we'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe he got robbed at one stage too. <laughs> Yes, he the yes, he the convict becomes the victim. And he was robbed by people he knew. Uh, even um, Reverend Robert Cartwright was involved and he was a, a reverend. Uh, yeah, and he found found his clothes on other people. And so oh. yeah. So they, they got in trouble instead of him for change. Uh, and what was the sentence they got? I believe it was pretty harsh. I think there's a bit of flogging going on. I yeah, I, I was reading that. I don't know if this is right, but it got 200 lashes and oh, yeah. um, six months with the iron collar. Mm. Which, yeah. That's painful. <laughs> <laughs> so how many children did he have? Well, he had the two in, in England and, and the one survived. And in Australia, he had Rebecca, who only survived for a couple of days. And she's buried in St. John's, Parramatta. And um, Elizabeth, um, Mary, Susanna, I'm descended from Susanna. Um, then there were two children, Anne and, oh, and James. James was born after Rebecca, and he seems to have disappeared, but I will find him. Um, Anne and William appear in the family surreptitiously 
and a bit mysteriously, and they changed their name to Kiss later in life. And we've just, uh, the descendants have conducted a DNA project and has proven that Anne and William were in fact the children of Mary, Elizabeth Roos, but not James Roos. Oh, okay. So while he was out to sea trying to keep the whole thing together, he's obviously had a bit of a fling with James Kiss, who was a fellow convict. But th this speaks of his um, compassion as well. He, he took them in and raised them okay. with the family, with the Roos family. And, in fact, so close were they that when Elizabeth Roos died in 1836, uh, he, James Kiss and James Roos, went and got baptised in the Catholic Church together at the same time. That's uh, quite unusual. Did James ever return to a life of crime? No, he didn't. And again, to his credit, um, uh, in the 1820s or so, someone approached him to do something shonky, to hide wheat under James Roos's bed and then sell it on behalf of the other person, a dodgy deal, and he refused to do it. What about so Elizabeth? He, Did she ever get into trouble again? No, no, no. She, they became model citizens, really. In fact, um, James Roos moved up in the echelons of society and he was actually um, a witness to Andrew Thompson's will. Andrew Thompson was quite famous on the, the Hawkesbury. And Elizabeth was um, received a early pardon. And they, yeah, they're quite well respected. And they were successful farmers out in the Hawkesbury? Other, other than the floods, <laughs> and the, <laughs> the famine. And the, uh, uh, James Roos ended up working as an overseer to Richard Brooks. So he had an actual job at the end. Okay. And uh, Elizabeth was with him. And he had a little, he had a bit of plot of land and a horse. So he, he didn't have quite comfortable in his life. He never made, I don't think he was a good uh, wheeler dealer from the land department because he lost a few things to uh, more, he mortgage and lost. But I would say a very successful farmer, perhaps not so successful in money management, a very compassionate person, uh, the way he treated his extended family and stayed with Elizabeth and looked after, looked after everybody. He took in, when Anne, one of the daughter Anne, husband left it, that was the one that became a kiss, he took in her son to live with them and someone else took in a couple of other children and they, they, they really had a good family situation. And, father, sorry. and is that where they stayed for the rest of their lives? They scattered, uh, the, Elizabeth married an armfield and they went down Berrima away. There are a lot of armfields down in Berrima. Um, Susanna Mine, she a bit of a flighty lady. <laughs> she um, left her husband and took up with um, someone who was working on their property and married him and went to Yast and had another baby with someone else in the meantime. <laughs> And uh, yeah, they scattered. We don't know ever what happened to Anne, Ruth, Kiss, whatever. She married several times. It's practically untraceable. And I will find James Ruth. He was um, he was apprenticed to Cable and Underwood in 1801, so we know he was alive then. He was mentioned in uh, a document in 1815, so somebody assumed he was alive in 1815. But that's another little 20 years to find him but yeah it's actually it's, easier to trace when they're convicts isn't it <laughs> it is yes Except if they live happily ever day. after you don't hear anything <laughs> oh no that's right they you need, need to have done something worthy of mentioning in the newspaper or court yeah that's right is it true that he made his own headstone yes it is believed and it's it's not in i'd say it's absolutely true because he um 
it's in the first person it's it's written oh right my, my mother reared me tenderly with me she took much pains and all spelt colloqu- uh, phonetically and when i arrived in this colony i sold the first grain now someone has come in and filled in the dates for him and uh it, it, i've read that it was that person was a man called thomas shea and when i had to have the headstone removed because of vandalism in the in the church uh often this thomas shea used to sign his name at the bottom of the of the headstones that he that he created and the, when the headstone came out there was no signature on it thomas shea but that's possibly because he didn't carve the headstone he spilled in the dates now that's why it was essential to have it removed and placed safely in the Campbelltown AIDS Historical Society Museum where it's safe it can be seen forever because that would be that, that is irreplaceable yeah definitely so many convicts didn't even have headstones because no. they just couldn't afford them no well if you do it yourself <laughs> yeah wow and, so uh, that's that's been really interesting talking to you um is it true also that he claims to have been the first person for well, first European to set foot on Australian soil from the first fleet. That is true that he claimed that. And it's quite hysterical when you get a bunch of first fleeters together and several people claim it <laughs> in the same <laughs> venue. But he did appear in a court case in 1830 something or other. And he, he claimed and swore on the Bible that because he carried, he said he carried um, Captain Hunter on shore, maybe speak anywhere, that he made that claim in court. And, and then the following day, someone else wrote something that he carried Colonel Johnston. But not, neither were ever refuted at, in, in, in the time. And no one else has ever given any evidence like that anything in writing that their claimers had set first foot on new holland so we don't know but he the evidence is that he he, he claimed it and nobody refuted it right so you are so lucky to have a convict that there's so much documentation for like he's as you mentioned he's in what contentious um, journals he's in other journals uh yeah and and now he's remembered in so many ways james roost drive uh, i believe there's yeah. an ag- agricultural yeah. school yeah. named after him can you parks. think of, yeah there are parks named a suburb the suburb of roost yeah that's right that must be so, really lovely for you and your family and, and i must say sorry sorry um I believe you've you've written a book about him some time ago. Um, why why did you create this book? What inspired you I, for him I, specifically out of your everyone in your family tree? Because when I was going to school, my mother, my grandmother used to say, "Don't you?" She called him James Rouse because she's she's close to the Cornish side and she still had that country sort of accent, and she. I had a little plaque. I used to take it to school and hold up. And change it. Oh. But I didn't actually know how, and she didn't know how either. So I set about finding how, and that took me five years because of the there's the Irish in there and the variations of names, but I finally got it together. And then I wasn't satisfied, so then I went back to see what happened in England before, but nothing was known about his life in England other than that he was a convict. But, yeah, and I haven't stopped. I probably never will stop. I just keep going, branching out and branching out. A labour of love. Yeah. But one <laughs> little thing I often bugs me, um, Arthur Phillips said, there can be some more intelligent, but no, no one more industrious. And I think about that sometimes because intelligence can't be equated with education. You could be, you could be a very intelligent person who's never been to school and lived in under a rock but it doesn't mean that you're not you don't have the intelligence and you don't have the education but that's he had right street, i think he had the street smarts to mm. do what he did yeah definitely 
Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking with us. It's been really interesting. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks so much. Thanks for your And time. where can um, people get your book? Can I leave a link in the show notes where people can contact you for a copy? Yes, I can give you, I can, you can give them my email address. Fantastic. Well, you. thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> All right. Bye. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Convict Australia podcast. If you'd like to show your appreciation and get more involved, there are a number of ways you can. The first is by signing up to Convict Australia on Patreon and you will get some perks like the Convict Australia newsletter. Secondly, leave a review and tell your friends and family. This really does make a huge difference. And lastly, join the Facebook and Instagram group Convict Australia. All the links I've mentioned will be in the show notes. Thank you again. Till next time.